He's one of the many people who made it happen. Come to the stage, please. Give us all your respectful exuberance, your applause, your loud noises, your quiet noises, your shrieks, and whatever else you can do for justice! Hey. That was the manliest welcome I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> anyway, hi. Uh, my name is Justin Frank. I am from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I'm new to the Orlando poetry scene, kind of. Um, I started last October or September, so it's been like five months. Um, so yeah, as you'll see, a lot of my poetry kind of tackles a lot of LGBT issues and stuff like that. Um, I talk a lot about like HIV, blood donation, sex addiction, gender norms, stuff like that. Uh, but I also have some other poems that don't talk about being gay. And by other poems, I mean one poem that doesn't talk about being gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do that first to kind of ease you into this like super gay feature. So, our nature? I got man. No. This is a teacher. I don't like no. No. Nature. No. Nature. No. Okay. Anyways, so this poem is called Spaceship and or Rocket Ship. Woo! Dog is so ready. Ever since I was little, I knew I was different. I always played with the toys that my sister got. I was supposed to play with the soldiers and the toy guns. You know, the only toy that I liked that fit the gender norm that was placed upon me at birth was a toy rocket ship I got for my 11th birthday. Looking back, I think that rocket ship was a metaphor for an escape. Because you know that there are no laws in space, that once you leave the stratosphere, you're free. Free from Indiana bills, free from FDA regulations, from debt and college loans and police brutality. Free from hate, free from limitations, placed on minorities simply for being minority. Scientists claim that global warming is said to be the cause of the holes in the ozone layer. But you know what worries me? It worries me that maybe those holes aren't caused by global warming. Maybe those holes are people trying to escape, people who have put their world in a tiny rocket ship with a tank full of whatever it is that they have that I don't in order to escape this world. In my mind, space is the exit. You know, the next step, a place for equality, true equality, no laws telling me I can't, no government telling me I must, no president pushing back the progress that took so long to achieve. I'm scared that the wrong man is the reason for one of the holes in the ozone layer, that he's already out there, that the wrong person is going to be there before I am, that laws, that regulations will be put into place before I have a chance to even get there, that the same limitations will keep me locked into this cookie cutter mold and I will grow like mold on the corner of some abandoned warehouse house full of missed opportunities. Right now there are six people that are known to be located in space. But what about the ones that are unaccounted for? What about the people who found their own way out there? What about the missing persons reports? In 2010, 692,944 missing person cases were reported. They have to be somewhere. There has to be more to their story. I refuse to think that their story is over. You know, maybe they left. Maybe they found a way out. Maybe they found what was missing here on Earth and went with it. Maybe I can find what's missing here on Earth and go with them. I want to find it out there. Whatever it is that they found, I know it's got to be better than the life I have here. It has to be. I know it's got to be better than the life that they had here. It has to be. I want to put my life savings, which I don't have. I want to sell my Jeep, which is a lease. I want to sell everything I own, which I don't have much. I want to find the parts I need. I want to create something, something that will take me past the stratosphere. I know where the closest hole in the ozone layer is I can see it in my dreams I need to put my life in a rocket ship and get the hell out of here I want to be one of the unaccounted people in space it's got to be better out there it is I've seen it and in my dreams I'm there I'm there with every missing person that was never found. We are standing in a line. You see, someone who made it here before me found a radio on the moon that was left in 1969. It's not in great condition, you see. We can send messages, but we can't receive any messages. We are all trying to send a message to our families, to our friends, to our loved ones. Houston, Houston, can you hear me? Houston, we are okay. We are okay. That's 
like my one poem is not about being gay. Uh, that's it though. So this next poem, get to the gay, get to the gay. This next poem talks about being gay a little bit, but just and then it's gonna be like gay. So uh, more gay. So this next poem is called Refresh. Um, it's like a button on a keypad that I really, really like. I remember sitting in my high school. Uh, I try out for like all the choirs and all the uh, musicals. I was like really stereotypically gay. Um, and I remember sitting in my parents' living room, pressing refresh, like, am I in the cast? Am I in the cast? And I always was in the cast, but I was never the fucking lead. So um, this poem is called Refresh, and it's kind of about taking that button and turning it into like my life and refreshing my moments in my life. So yeah, I'm going to stop rambling and just go right into it. Okay. Christopher Scholes created the first typewriter in 1868, thus creating the first keyboard. But it wasn't until much later down the line that my favorite addition was placed onto that keyboard. F5, or Control plus R, or a key that simply says refresh. How liberating it was to just click the button and watch the screen start anew. The fact that I could just start from fresh at the click of a button makes me wish I had something like this for my own life. Refresh, it is February 15, 2016 at 1.10 in the morning. I get a call from my mother. She tells me that my sister is in the hospital. Try to kill herself. No, this can't be right. This isn't real. Refreshed, I've been sitting in the waiting room for over an hour now, and the doctor finally calls me in. My whole body feels drained. I know there is something wrong. You know, this is why I hate going to the doctors. This is why every gay man hates going to the doctors. As soon as I get into the room behind a closed door, I completely break down. I can't stop crying, you know. I think this is it. I think I finally caught it. You know, I'm the stigma, I deserve this, I did this to myself. No, no, I'm not ready to face this. Refresh, Jordan, what do you want? It's late. My sister opens up the door and enters my room, tears running down her face while the words, I'm scared, Justin, I don't want to die, poured from her mouth and an empty pill bottle drops to the floor. <coughs> she rushed to the emergency room. No, no, we, we just did this. She's better now, she's shown no signs. No, no, Refresh, I'm laying in bed with a guy I've been talking to for a while. And the topic of politics comes up. Uh -oh. Yeah, that one. Um, so he looks at me and not only says that he's a Trump supporter, but that he also doesn't believe in white privilege. What the fuck? <laughs> Refresh. Oh, fuck. Do you know what time it is? The guy whose name escapes my memory leans over to grab his phone and tells me that it's noon. I get up, start to put on my clothes when I notice the Confederate flag hanging above his bed. Uh -oh. Fuck. <laughs> Refresh. You know, this one has got me out of a lot of different situations in my life. I'm in Wisconsin as a 10-year-old boy, slowly figuring out that there's something that makes me different than all the other boys. Refresh, I'm 22 years old. I just graduated college in Rochester Hills, Michigan. I've grown bored of this city. Refresh, I'm living in Orlando Well, kissing me. I don't like to say that. I'm 22 years old. I work at a private university, and my job makes me want to kill myself every day. Refresh, I quit my job that makes me want to kill myself every day. Refresh, I'm a host at Rainforest Cafe. I quit my job that paid $23 an hour to make barely over minimum wage. Refresh, I'm a server at Olive Garden. I have a bachelor's degree, and I'm a server at Olive Garden. I spent $40,000 on a college degree, and I'm a server at Olive Garden. Refresh, I'm standing in front of a room full of strangers, shouting out a poem I wrote at 3.30 in the morning. Refresh, I'm standing in front of a room full of strangers, shut... Wait, that can't be right. Refresh, I'm standing in front of a room full of... What? Refresh, I'm standing in front of a room, but why isn't this working? This can't just end here, there has to be more, there has to be more. Refresh, I'm standing in front of a room full of... Okay, so that was my... Oh yeah, oh, no, well, that was your what? Oh yeah, hi, that was my refresh poem. Ooh. Wait, did you say your refresh poem? His refresh poem. All right, speaking of refresh, this is the point of the feature where we pass around our wonderful donation box. You can, uh, I actually have cash for once. Yeah. Put some cash in here. Yeah, uh, merch. I feel like there's something money. else that, we, that I should be saying. But yes, I believe your feature for the evening has some merch. Uh, you're selling chapbooks, are you not? Yes, I'm selling chapbooks. How much are you selling? They're $5. Holy $5. That's really free. No, no, no. We don't say that's practically free. We don't devalue art. We say that's really reasonably priced. That's really reasonably priced. What? Because it is. What are you talking about? That's practically free. No. That's practically. Then why not make it? No. 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 That's really reasonably priced. Sorry. Uh, there was going to be more to this, but now I'm just rambling. So uh, if you don't have, 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 have
Yeah. If you don't want to buy yeah, it, like, yeah, just yeah, 10 yeah, bucks, yeah, or yeah, if you want to just, like, like give it an honest yeah. donation, we'll be passing this fucking around to refresh his bank account. Rest my bank account! And we're going to start along the road here. And uh, pass it whichever way is more comfortable to you, and we'll make it around the room. Please invest in living artists, especially if you enjoy the person that you're hearing on stage. Considering this person's alive, and they're giving the performance right now that you're enjoying. I'll get you a taco, man. Uh, I have said enough obvious shit, and I'm gonna get off the stage and go back to your wonderful feature. Yeah, Thank you, my lord. Honestly, I'm selling chapbooks after this. Um, they're five dollars. Only the quality is like man, but the quality of the poetry is like really fucking good. Yeah. Uh, it's called Sex, Sin, and Spaceships. Uh, I'm sorry. I swear to God. And it says insert badass over here. It's like he's drunk. So I'm really witty and have good poetry. Buy this for five dollars. Oh, nothing cool. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go to my poems now. So my next poem is called Blood Donations, because that's a fun topic. Okay. So, blood donations make me really fucking pissed. Um, so, the FDA has this regulation. Um, they just recently changed it, but before, if you've had, if a gay, if a man has had sex with another man since like 1987 or 86, you cannot donate blood. So, in these last couple of years, they just changed it, and now gay men can't donate blood if they've had sex with another man within the last 12 months, which is really fucking fucked up. Um, so pretty much straight men can have all the sex they want, never wear a condom in their life, and they can donate blood and they'll never fucking get asked about it. But as soon as I say I'm gay, I cannot donate blood. So that makes me really fucking pissed. And when I'm pissed, I bitch a lot, I drink a lot, and then I write poetry. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually that. Hell yeah, he does. Hell yeah, I do. So this one's called Blood Donations. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The FDA performs over a dozen tests on every pint of blood that is donated. This makes it possible to catch blood that carries infectious diseases. However, the FDA's rule denying gay men who have had sexual interactions with another man within the last 12 months completely marginalizes the gay community. I'm sitting in the chair. The room is frigid. The nurse asked me if I've had sex with a man within the last year. Uh, yeah. Uh, when the nurse tells me I'm unable to donate blood at this time, I sit back and watch the interaction another nurse is having with a man wearing a cut-off tank top and a Make America Great Again hat again. I fucking hate those hats. You know, I'm dumb about it how fast she puts a needle in his arm. Did you know that there are no questions asked about sex if you're straight? The nurse didn't ask him how many partners he's had. If he said unprotected sex, nothing of that matter. This man literally could have had a hundred sex partners, never worn a condom, and he can donate blood and I can't. I'm sorry, FDA, but this is not 1987. We are not in the middle of an epidemic, and you need to realize that the blame of HIV does not belong to one group of people. Just over a year ago, 49 people in my community were killed in a club shooting, yet it was my community that was turned away when it came to donating blood to those of our community that needed it. Gay men were literally being denied gay blood. So marginalize my community, wow. FDA. Identify me by my sexuality. Stamp me as a carrier of HIV because of my sexuality. Put me into a box. Tell me to stay in between the lines. Tell me I'm gay so I can. You know, just once, I want to hear I'm gay so I can. Yes. <laughs> I was eight years old when I started to realize I was different. When I was 14, I came out of the closet and exchanged the word different. <laughs> with gay. I sat at a long table with God on the other side as he explained to me the side effects of being gay. He said people will see me as less than, an outsider, unable to blend in, feminine, weak because I'm feminine. And the last thing he told me was that there are some things in life that I'm going to have to work a lot harder for, that I'm going to be denied things, limited to things, and defined by this thing. So while I'm sitting in this frigid room in this plastic chair, I just stare blankly because that's what I do when I'm fucking pissed. And then I leave. But this is the imaginary confrontation I have with the nurse. You know, the things in your head that you always wish you had the nerve to say, but you don't? Excuse me, ma'am! I am completely baffled by this ideology that because I'm gay and because I've had sex with a man in the last year that I have HIV. You didn't even ask the other guy about his sex life. That's the problem. I just want to help. And at this point, tears are rushing down my face as I'm sitting in the parking lot and I realize that the nurse is just following the regulations placed by the FDA. I'm embarrassed by my imaginary confrontation with this nurse when I notice the guy at the cut-up tank top and the Make America Great Again hand walk out. Fuck that guy. His arm was bandaged where the needle was. <coughs> and I'm at in my car crying again. You know, 
I have a meeting with God a week from today. I want to go over these side effects, you know. They're really starting to get to me. Um, this next poem is called Addiction. Um, it's about sex addiction. Um, I think this is a topic um, that I, I struggle with, obviously, because um, I wrote about it. Um, I think a lot of gay men may or may not struggle with this. Um, I think it kind of comes down to gender norms and stuff like that, uh, which kind of is where a lot of my poetry derives from, as you'll see in these next two poems. Um, so yeah, this one's called Sex Addiction. And I'm going to read it now. <laughs> this is how my theoretical addiction meeting would go. <coughs> Hello, my name is Justin. Hi, Justin. The other members would echo, you know, I feel like it would be just like the movies. Well, I'm here today because I've come to grips with my addiction. I think, well, no, I know that I'm a sex addict. People would scoff, my mother would be disappointed to hear, my father would just be worried I would text something, my doctor would grow tired of seeing me for checkups so often, and my eyes would meet one of the other men who sits in the circle across from me at a Sunday afternoon meeting, and I would then go and have sex with him in his car when the meeting was done. And then I would cry in my car, spray my cologne, and drive home, all but checking grinder to see if anyone else in the area is looking. And for all your straights out there, looking in the gay community just means down to fuck. Sounds like a pretty good fucking way to meet a lot of people who have a lot of sex. Like, hey, here's an idea. Let's put all the people who like to fuck all the time and put them in one room and hope that they don't fuck each other. You know, people don't really understand. My best friend Kelly tells me that she gets mad when she hears my poetry because I'm causing all these problems to myself and doing these problems to myself. As such as said, I can just shut it off. But this addiction isn't exactly what it is. A fucking addiction. You know, before tonight, I've never said the words out loud, I am a sex addict. It sounds juvenile to me, it sounds like a whiny brat to me, it sounds like I'm a man who's supposed to want sex, so because I'm admitting I have a problem with this, that I am somehow less of a man, somehow less desirable, somehow less likely to meet someone who's, I don't know, actually fucking into me? I don't know why I do this. Why is my brain like this? Why do I find satisfaction in pleasing people? Is it because I like to chase? Is it because I always chase and that no one has yet to chase me? That I feel as if I don't use my hands, my mouth, my privates, that I don't want to get to know my laugh, my smile, my heart. I blame the gay community. My friend Kelly blames me. My mother, I assume, would blame my age and my grandmother would just pretend that everything is okay. I guess that's what I do is pretend that everything is okay, that I'm not addicted to sex, that this is just normal, that I am just normal, and that this is just the way that gay people live, that I am gay people, and that this is the way that I live. This is the way a gay man loves with his pants unbuttoned, his heart on his sleeve, and a box of condoms on the bedside table. So I'm going to end this poem now, because I'm getting quite uncomfortable with the fact that I've been talking about this problem that I still don't think I'm ready to face. So hello. My name is Justin, and I will use this poem as my first sex addiction meeting. Hello, Justin. You would all echo back as I sit my room temperature coffee and stare down at my stale powdered donut holes while my brain implodes on itself because it feels betrayed for being brought to this cold afternoon room in the first place. This room where I'm just supposed to pour out my emotions to strangers and be fixed. Can I just get my chip now? Do sex addicts even get chip? Like an like AA? Like a, I haven't had sex in one month chip? Yeah? Cool. I'll be back in a month for it. Okay. So I have one more poem. Uh, this is like the poem like that I connect to the most. Uh, like I said, a lot of my stuff comes from like gender norms and stuff like that. Um, a lot of stuff comes from gender. A lot of stuff comes from gender norms. I just write a lot about it and whine about it and bitch about it a lot. Good. And drink quite right. a bit a lot. Why? Um, Why bitch, bitch about it? I don't know. Bitch, stop. Stop making weird fun. It's mostly, I have the gift of a curse. It's a curse. <laughs> it's a curse. It's a curse. Stop! It's completely a curse. <laughs> but yeah, so this last poem is called Boys Will Be Boys. It's kind of about gender norms. Um, hey. I think it's really problematic that boys aren't taught to say no to sex growing up. Uh, if you guys can think back to fifth grade health class, all the girls are taught to say no to sex. All the boys are taught to wear a condom, and I think this is really problematic. Um, I think a lot of issues derive from this. So I wish we could just go into fifth grade health classes and teach everybody that sex is sacred, that sex is whatever you want it to be, but sex you can say no to and you don't have to want it. So that's where this poem kind of comes into play, and I'm going to read it. Okay, cool. Yay. 
I don't understand why 10 year old boys in 5th grade health class are being blamed for the actions of twisted men who have thrusted their sexual drive onto others without warrant. Why are we only teaching girls to say no to sex? We are denying an entire gender, an entire half of our population, the boys that play with toy trucks, the boys that play with Barbies, the ability to say no, the power to say no, the education to say no. Just tell them to stop, say no, tell them you're not interested, my friend Kelly says in a joking manner. Yeah, that may be easy for you to say, Kelly, but you've been taught to say no since you were 11 years old in fifth grade health class. In fact, every girl was taught to say no in that fifth grade health class. Look, in the conversations that we are having about sex and choice surrounding the word no, men are being ignored. This is due to the, the fact that very often men are the ones committing these acts of aggression, but what about those who are not? So this poem, this poem is for every single boy in that fifth grade health class. This is for every teenage boy who was pressured into having sex when he wasn't ready. This is for every 23-year-old man who was sat in his room with his clothes by his bedside and bears with his actions as another stranger leaves his room. You see, I see this scene that constantly plays in my bed. I'm sitting in my bed, watching you pull the shirt over your bare skin as you head for the door. Use me. You came here and fucked me because you knew that I couldn't say no. I was never taught to say no, 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 I will not kiss you, no, you cannot have sex with me, no, I am better than this, all things that I was never taught to say. How do we not see this as problematic? Girls are taught to say no, boys are taught to use a condom. Girls are taught that boys are only after one thing, boys are taught to only be after one thing. Girls are painted as the gatekeepers of sex and boys are painted as the ones trying to pick the lock. Tell me why boys play the role of scapegoat for the twisted rapists pushing their sexual desires without consent. Better yet, tell me why boys are not taught to give consent. Maybe, just maybe the problem of rape doesn't belong to one gender, maybe. Maybe it belongs to the education, or therefore lack of education. Now I know the power of no does not always work like it should, but it's a goddamn start. I dream of a day when fifth grade health class teachers will explain the power of no to everyone, because the power of no does not belong to one gender. So this poem, this poem is for the boys. Don't listen to them. You don't have to want sex. You can say no. You can say no. Okay, so yeah, um, that kind of wraps up my feature. Um, I told you lots of gay issues were tackled, and we had a poem about spaceships. Gays and spaceships, great. Uh, so yeah, uh, like I said, you guys can buy that <laughs> buy my chat book for five dollars. Sex and uh, sex, sex and spaceships. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys for being such a great crowd. Um, I'm so humbled and appreciated to be such uh, a part of this community. Uh, so thank you, Joe. Thank you, Ryan. You take cards? I'm not that Do you have cash app? Do you have a square account? I don't know what that is. I have Venmo. That works out. I don't have Venmo. You have cash app? One more round of applause here in Shepard Feature, Justin. Uh, yeah, we're gonna take a break in a minute, about 10 minutes or so, and uh, you guys uh, find Justin somewhere in this bar and chat him up, buy any books from him, or buy him a drink. Probably, preferably buy him a, buy a chocolate, but you know, whatever, whatever he gets to do. Um, yeah, so, I'll give you uh, two tidbits. Uh, actually, no, we'll just give you one tidbit, because uh, the suspense of the order should be saved for the beginning of the second round. But, before we take a break of about ten minutes, quick question. How many people in this room know about New Peace Mondays? Yeah! Put your hands together if you had a New Peace. New Peace! New Peace! I have not had a chance to take that, but I will see. Now, we have lots of... 
cool nights that we're trying to bring out, bring attention to Orlando. But one of our judges, Orange, back there. If you have any questions, this is an event that happens the first uh, the, uh, every Monday. Monday. Every Monday. I'm so sorry. Every Monday. Definitely go talk to him because uh, I've had beer and I'm not sure he has. It's dope. Uh, but uh, so many people that I know have gone there and had a fantastic time. So definitely. Chat up orange. It's go. And, uh, go, go. After you chat up orange, go chat up your future, or whichever order you can do this in. And uh, we'll be getting to round two with the order of who's made it in about ten minutes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>